Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gayatri. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You will also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. I continue my conversation with Andy Hiller, the CEO of Accelerance. He leads and advocates for the globalization and collaboration of great software teams across the world. In this second part, Andy discusses the challenges of working with multiple service providers and the importance of building cohesive teams. He emphasizes the need for trust, accountability, and common values in creating successful partnership, regardless of whether you are working with one partner or multiple partners. He also touches upon the impact of AI on the IT landscape and highlights the proliferation of service providers due to remote work and the challenges companies face in leveraging AI effectively. He again stresses the importance of trust, credibility, and a focus on what AI cannot do, advocating for investing in interpersonal skills and problem-solving abilities. I asked him for some career tips and Andy advised that leaning into challenges rather than retreating from them, emphasizing action over inaction. He encourages individuals to continuously improve themselves and to maintain determination in the face of obstacles. And finally, I had to ask him about his travel preferences for a person who's traveled across the globe. And Andy expressed his interest in revisiting India and Japan due to their unique cultures and vast diversity. Overall, we talked about the themes related to teamwork, adaptation to technological advancements, personal growth, and cultural appreciation. Listen on. Many large companies I've seen working with multiple service providers someone who does the software development, somebody else who does the integration, and the, probably a third one who does the, uh, the IBNB type of activities. Mm-hmm. And somewhere between the cracks, you know, something you know, just falls through and uh, ultimately there's an impact. So uh, the model that you are recommending about you know, creating more cohesive teams and all that, uh, how can that be scaled to include teams from multiple organizations? Um, well, there's there's no rule that you can't replicate. What what I'm proposing is is not that um, onerous of an investment. Mm-hmm. It, it's a way of doing business. Uh, it's you know uh, building relationships based on trust and familiarity and mm-hmm. uh, with a vision of uh, longevity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, uh, we can't, con- we only can control what we can control. There's outside influences that might uh, make us want to dissolve a relationship for various reasons. I mean, uh, cost factors and inflation and global instability and things like that. But, you know, my recommendations and how we operate uh, is you know consistent whether you're working with one partner or multiple partners. Mm-hmm. It's uh, you know it's it's about creating that what we like to call a one shore culture mm-hmm. um, that re- that revolves around a, a, a uh, significant investment in interaction, in accountability, mm-hmm. in common values. You know around trust and radical candor, and, and measuring that over time. Um, breaking down silos of of uh, you know um, communication and alignment between different functions in the business, uh, and um, you know it's 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 more beneficial and, and frankly even more difficult to dissolve a relationship that uh, you have a personal commitment towards. You're willing to go the extra mile in order to problem solve and figure your way out of it because you value one another. Uh, you know, one of the things that I just touched upon earlier was about servant leadership. And that's another, you know, sort of standard that that 
you know, I believe in. And that is, uh, it's, it's more difficult to get the client to do it, obviously, because the client's like, I'm, I'm the guy paying the bills. Why do I need to be a servant leader? Uh, yes, the service providers are servant leaders to me, but that's what I expect of them. But, uh, you know, the real trick here is, is because as a client, you want, uh, you want to make sure that your uh, service provider and the people that are working for you are both uh, extrinsically as well as intrinsically motivated uh, to do the best for you, that they have a commitment to you, uh, that they, they trust you and they work hard for you because they value what you bring. And in order to get that result, you know, you, you need to figure out what is intrinsically and extrinsically motivating to that service provider. It sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but also once you understand it, it sounds completely intuitive. Yeah, obviously in hindsight. Because the reason <laughs> I asked this question was um, so many years ago, uh, it is all uh, Indian players. There's one hardware manufacturer uh, in, into other product manufacturing who wanted to get into software uh, or software-based solutions you know, for their hardware. So they engaged two service providers, mm. again, two Indian firms, one that would do the initial development of the software, and another one that would do the integration and the final verification. Uh, unfortunately, what happened was since both of these were service providers pretty much operating in the same market and were competitors, there were a lot mm -hmm. of issues in working as one team. So, which is when I was called into you know, see how we can you know, make this. And a lot of what you say, you know, makes sense. And then some of this is what finally happened. Where they could all see that they are part of one team. Either you know, uh, If they don't collaborate, then it's like they're letting the customer down. So sure. it took some time, but, um, you know, the uh, servant leadership and these things uh, should span organizational boundaries and have the, the project goal as the common goal around which they could rally around. You know, yeah. I I agree that relationships, you know, are are ultimately built on productivity and KPIs, mm -hmm. and you know, in, in higher increasing the bar in, in order to be more competitive uh, than than your you know competitive set. Um, but it's you know this this whole mentality about um, just chasing a, a KPI, chasing a number. And going through churn and, and using this stick and carrot, you know, approach to things, very transactional, very arm's length, uh, it it actually doesn't get you as far as you think it would. Mm. Um, and I and um, you know, I stress to to clients here in the U.S. is that uh, you're not just paying for a number because you'll ultimately always be disappointed. Uh, you have to invest you know, time, energy, and money. In, in building a team that's going to work for you better. Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, if, if you're just trying to hit a number, you're going to go through so much churn. You're going to lose so much time and effort in switching providers, in, you know, putting companies on plans, on, uh, you know, negotiating for, you know, better pricing. If you can't get the numbers, you need to have lower cost. And, and there's just everything about that is like, so oriented towards combative friction, uh, sort of this binary competition between a, a vendor and, and a client that, uh, you're not seeing your competition blow by you because they're creating a, a better, more holistic, you know, environment. Talking about that, uh, of course we, cannot not talk about AI. People are saying that no, we don't need programmers. AI will do everything. Or we'll automate most of the tasks that are needed today you know, with AI. So two questions there. You know, mm -hmm. what, uh, do you see that happening? And if so, how long would it be before you know, that becomes fairly uh, common or uh, adopted by most? And the second question is, um, if we need to have AI-based solutions, and you know, who's going to train those systems? Hmm. So, yeah, great questions. Um, and I'm not going to try to be too much of a prognosticator because, if, you know, ultimately I'll be wrong, like everyone else will be. Um, the only people that are right are the people 
that say they said something in the past that has now taken place and they take credit for it. Uh, but, but there's no documentation that they ever said that. <laughs> so, um, you know, so what I'm seeing in the marketplace right now is, is, um, the market is still relatively soft for outsourcing, and that's a, a couple of reasons. One is that in the last five years, the number of service providers that we're tracking uh, around the world that are between 75 software engineers and around 3,000 software engineers has risen from uh, 8,000 service providers to over 25,000. Um, and why is that? It's because, you know, uh, most every business has been forced or has elected to go remote, which doesn't require a lot of investment in infrastructure and leasehold improvements and doesn't require uh, co-location and drawing people from a you know relatively small geographic area to commute on a daily basis. So now um, you know you can essentially open up a uh, a service a service shop overnight claiming that you cover you know every technology on the planet and claiming that you have essentially all the great talent, the top 1% that everyone says on the planet because uh, everything is remote. Uh, all, all talent is available to you. And within that talent, all you know domain expertise is available to you. So, so companies say that even though they may not, on LinkedIn, they may have, you know, 10 full-time employees associated with your company, but they'll say that they have 500 or a thousand because they have access to 500 or a thousand. So it's the, the bar for, you know, creating an entity um, has, has lowered so, so much. And the, and the, the population of service providers and, and the sheer sort of white noise uh, that is in the marketplace, you know, has, has created a, a real commoditized, uh, offering around the world that that actually makes it much more difficult for you know legitimate really you know sharp organizations to to thrive or or to grow because there's just so much white noise in the marketplace now how does that relate to ai um a lot of companies are being uh, more and more confused over how to leverage offshore uh, obviously, you know, in the the last couple of years, there's there's been some you know economic and political and uh, nationalistic turmoil around the world, um, inflation and such that has uh, halted a lot of investment in innovation. Uh, this year, we're coming out of it. We see more investment, but again, there's a lot more white noise. Uh, but then companies are 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 now so entrenched in trying to figure out the the application of AI, uh, I'm hearing that a lot of companies are really trying to figure out, one, uh, can they multiply the uh, effectiveness of their internal staff through AI? Uh, you know, can they uh, identify a certain percentage of, of their current staff's um, activities and, and apply AI to it, thus backfilling those people with more higher value added services. So a lot of this calculation and this trial and error is going on, which of course takes people's minds off of trying to, you know, get solutions from offshoring or outsourcing to service providers. So sort of gumming up the entire natural process pre AI, people are trying to figure out what is AI is AI my outsourced, uh, you know, option. Before outsourcing, and and then the other thing is is okay if if I uh, this is it's going to take me too long or I don't have the ability to to figure this out but I need to get stuff done I, I need to innovate today because I'm losing market share so I do need to find a service provider that you know is aligned with me in terms of technology and subject matter expertise or vertical expertise or whatever I need in order to innovate um, how do I measure that service provider from day one should they be what can i expect from a uh velocity from a, a um, productivity perspective from day one as opposed to 365 days ago you know how are they demonstrating to me that they are better faster uh 
you know, with AI? How are they deploying AI? And then again, how am I going to measure them going forward? What do I expect them to be in a year from now? Uh, are they good stewards of of you know uh, deploying or assessing uh, you know other types of AI to make them more productive? Will I be able to reduce my headcount over time? Or if I don't reduce my headcount, will I be able to double my productivity over time? How do I measure that? It's all nebulous. I'm just getting, people are saying things to me and I'm not exactly sure how to process them or what to expect. And if I choose this service provider, uh, you know, how do I know these other service providers that say, well, I'll provide you 250% or mm-hmm. I'll cut, you know, you know, cut my headcount or cost by this amount. It's like, who do I believe? I mean, honestly, is there's it's when people say better, faster, cheaper, and now you throw an AI, it's like a fourth thing that I can't believe. <laughs> there was three things I didn't believe, and now there's four things I don't believe. And so, frankly, it's it's gumming up, it's slowing down that whole uh, due diligence, uh, credibility, and trust about that. And uh, so, you know, accelerants actually, we are always thinking about what can AI not do? I mean, uh, and it gets back to the smart people, hire smart people, you know, credible organizations with uh, a breadth and depth of leadership across these these different facets uh, are going to figure it out. They're probably going to figure it out better and faster. Uh, and because you have a relationship with them, they're going to want to share those uh, increased benefits through AI with you. Uh, will it be the perfect application uh, of you know efficiency and quality and cost savings or whatever metrics you prioritize? Um, it's hard to say, but if you have a trustworthy, credible relationship, uh, and you treat each other with respect and you and you deploy servant leadership, the odds are that you know you're going to get a, a good return on that. There's just too many variables in the marketplace to to try to try to figure out. You have to start with who do you trust and who is credible? Yeah, I like <laughs> to take it as something positive that uh, for people looking at careers in IT, they still have a lot of opportunities. They absolutely have a lot of opportunities, you know, and, and it really gets back to what are people or companies willing to do? Uh, are they willing to just sit on their hands and do nothing and then and then try to game their way out of things or cut corners or to try to find a tool? Look, all of that is commoditized. If you find a tool, everyone else has found the tool. If, if, if you know, you cut a corner, everyone else is cutting the corner. That's all commoditized uh, What as individuals. It, you know, it's there, you know, software needs uh, leaders. They need, uh, uh, you know, uh, credible users of technology. They need creativity. They need ethics and morals in order to make the right decisions. Uh, they need to, and then it gets down to personal things, you know, dependability uh, with an accountability. I mean, all of this stuff needs to be organized by individuals and, you know, a company or an individual, if they do things that AI can't do, if they work on their interpersonal, you know, qualities and communication, if they study and learn and, and, and know how to, you know, know, know the um, landscape of, of uh, different options and how to deploy it and how to think on their feet and how to problem solve. Uh, I mean, those are things that are always going to be valuable. Uh, Yes. There's going to be winners and losers. Uh, as there always have been, right? Yeah. That's a nice segue to uh, one favorite question that I ask pretty much all the guests uh, is about career tips. In uh, your case, what I want to know is something like what you mentioned now. For two segments of people, people who are considering a career in IT or those who typically go through what we may call as a midlife crisis. So I've been doing this, now I'm board or I want to do something else, I want to change, maybe switch to a more technical track or a managerial track or maybe do, go to a startup, whatever else. Uh, the way you see the IT landscape moving, what would be the core skills that one needs or the core technologies that one should be looking at now, whether you're a starter or a mid-career person? 
Well, um, uh, I'll preface this by saying, you know, every person is different and their personality is different. Um, so uh, I wouldn't obviously recommend one course of action. Uh, what I would recommend are a couple of um, reactions uh, and uh, personality traits when looking at uh, a career long term. And that is... Uh, well, let me start with fight or flight. Um, you know, the world is a stressful place. It's a competitive place. And um, whenever you have this decision between fight or flight, it's typically better to lean into the fight mm -hmm. uh, because it's very easy to to leave and to retrench um, and hope that something happens to you. Mm -hmm. Hope is not a strategy, as they say, right? Uh, it's action. So, you know, I've, I've been in a situation many, many times. I don't even want to think back about it, about, uh, you know, how I failed or how I was let go or how, you know, uh, between my own actions and between external actions that I couldn't control. Um, and what it did to me was it motivated me at that very moment to jump into like to analyze exactly what went wrong and to make sure that it wouldn't happen again to, you know, uh, like I had mentioned earlier in this discussion about do what AI can't do, uh, do what others aren't willing or able to do. Uh, and I think, um, you know, for, for each and every person listening to this, they have to constantly look at, let, let's say, a SWOT uh, analysis of their life. Uh, and and then constantly work on themselves to be better at what um, most others choose not to be better at or what they aren't better at themselves, uh, to be looking at that, to, to be more well-rounded, uh, to, you know, learn skills and technology. You know, the, the information is out there. The trends are out there as far as, you know, what's what's being uh, pursued uh, globally or, or, you know, within whatever industry you, you tend to pursue. Uh, but, you know, action takes precedence over inaction. And I would just, you know, tell everyone here listening that um, it's, it's not about getting knocked down or how many times you get knocked down. It's about, you know, how you get up, how you get up and, and join the fight, you know, as quickly as possible uh, and how you're self-reflective you know, look at yourself and, and take action. Uh, because ultimately, a lot of people just don't take action. They, they hope things happen. And they just don't want to go there. I mean, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Sounds simple, but I'm sure it takes a lot of practice and determination, particularly. It, it does. And, and people are in different situations, and they have different yeah. responsibilities, and they have uh, different distractions. And, and, uh, you know, between environment and culture and, and location and family and, uh, you know, sickness. And I mean, there's there's just a, a an a never ending array of of, you know, supposed barriers uh, to you to do that. But uh, you have to recognize that uh, mm -hmm. everyone has their own set of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you, you hit on the word it's, it's determination. Mm -hmm. Just keep on pressing forward. Keep on leaning yeah. in. On that positive note, I think we are just about running out of time, but a very quick question. Of yeah. all the places that you visited around the world, yeah. you've traveled a lot, which is the place that you would like to visit again or multiple times and not get bored? Uh, well, I have uh, two places in mind. And one is India, and it's not because, you know, of my host, uh, because it's such a massive country. And I've seen so little of it. I've been there now four times, but, you know, I could be there 400 times and, and not even and there, there is just so much variety and it's such a large country. Um, so I definitely want to get back to India and, and I may be getting back there in the next month or two. Uh, the other one is Japan, because Japan is such a unique somewhat self-isolating uh yeah, environment and culture um that that has such 
you know, I guess a unique sense of order and, and beauty. Um, obviously I think a lot of it comes from its homogeneity in, in the way they, you know, they, you know, maintain that, um, as opposed to like the melting pot, like, like the United States is, but it's just, it's such a fascinating, different culture on different on so many different levels. Uh, and I think India is like that too. Uh, you, you know, Europe and North America, even Latin America, it tends to be a little bit more uh, westernized, I guess, you know, uh, very not too much removed. And that's creature comfort in a way. But like India and Japan, I just think are just so uniquely fascinating. They could be on different planets, uh, which I just find just interesting beyond belief. Yeah. I wish that you... You know, get to visit and experience that, both India and Japan. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, uh, thanks a lot, Andy, for uh, coming on the show and sharing your perspectives. And some of these are very practical and at the same time, not so obvious that so many people don't realize that up front. Shiv, I, I really appreciate you inviting me on. It's, it's always great to share stories if I can motivate anyone out there. Uh, from the comfort of my own home in California and reach someone and, and give a little spark. That's, uh, that's very fulfilling. I hope I do that. Absolutely. Yeah. We thank Siddharth for the music and Anita for promoting the software people's stories. If you like this episode, Please subscribe on your favorite podcast client and spread the word in your network. If you'd like to share your story, contact us at podcasts at pm-powerconsulting.com.